Hello, this is Jeff Gambrone with the Military History Channel. In my last episode, I talked about uh, how World War II affected the men and women who actually served in the armed forces that were from Mississippi. In this episode, I'm going to talk about how the war impacted the state as a whole, particularly the, the home front. And um, in particular, I'm going to talk about the military installations uh, that uh, were in Mississippi during World War II because they were going to have a huge impact on the state, both economically and culturally. Uh, a, large, and a large part of this change was due to simply the, the huge military presence that was in Mississippi during, uh, during the war. Uh, during World War II, you had 36 military installations in the state with over a million men and women uh, uh, from all over the United States coming to these facilities. Uh, this was uh, just a, a huge uh, impact on the state, a very uh, insular and, and rather isolated uh, state, and it was going to have profound effects uh, on, the, on the men and women who lived in Mississippi uh, for years to come. And uh, some of the largest uh, military bases in, uh, in Mississippi during World War II were uh, Camp Shelby in Hattiesburg, uh, Keesler Airfield uh, in Biloxi. Uh, there were uh, major training camps, uh, Camp Van Dorn near Centerville, uh, Camp McCain near Grenada. And then uh, the Mississippi countryside was dotted with Army airfields, uh, the largest being uh, uh, Greenville, Columbus, Jackson, Laurel, Greenwood, Meridian. Uh, there were smaller airfields built at Clarksdale and Grenada, Gulfport, Hattiesburg, Madison, and Starkville. Uh, there was also one military hospital in the state, uh, Foster General Hospital, which opened in uh, West Jackson on December 14, 1942. So it, it was just the entire state was crisscrossed with facilities of one sort or another. And uh, um, Mississippians just couldn't help but interact with the uh, uh, the, the personnel that were assigned to these uh, to these camps. Now, in addition to the Army and Army Air Corps bases, uh, there were ordnance plants uh, built near Flora and Madison County and at Prairie and Monroe County. Uh, there was a small naval base at Gulfport, which is shown in the picture here. Um, and uh, the military also made use of college facilities, such as at the University of Mississippi, Mississippi State College, uh, Mississippi Southern College, uh, Millsaps College, and Mississippi College. And in fact, one of the best known uh, uh, soldiers to go through one of the, uh, the college programs here in the state uh, was this young man uh, who uh, uh, later became a well-known television, television personality, uh, Johnny Carson. Uh, he was uh, one of the Navy sailors who matriculated at Millsaps College during the war. He was part of the Navy's V-12 program to provide qualified officers for the Navy. And then uh, shown in the upper left-hand corner here is an inspection of student radio men at the Gulfport Naval Training Station, uh, August 4, 1945. And the the first uh, uh, camp I'm going to talk about is Camp Shelby, which originated in 1917 outside of Hattiesburg uh, to train troops for World War I. And uh, these pictures are taken from around that time period. Uh, the installation was named by uh, the first troops to train there, uh, uh, Indiana and uh, Kentucky National Guardsmen. Uh, and uh, the camp was later abandoned after World War I, but the state of Mississippi uh, reopened it in 1934 uh, to use it as a training area for the National Guard. Now, the people of Hattiesburg had never forgotten the, the economic advantages that Camp Shelby had brought to their region during World War I, and uh, as World War II was looming, uh, efforts were made by local politicians and local businessmen to have the federal government reopen the base as a national training center. On February 29, 1940, uh, U.S. Senator uh, Theo Theodore G. Bilbo, shown here uh, upper left, uh, introduced a resolution to Congress calling for Camp Shelby to be converted into a regular Army training center. A few months later, uh, Bilbo and Mississippi Congressman uh, William M. Calmer, shown down here in the bottom right, 
uh, introduced separate bills uh, authorizing the transfer of 65,000 acres in land in the DeSoto National Forest adjacent to Camp Shelby uh, from the Department of the Agriculture to the War Department. Uh, the bills passed the House and Senate in July 1940, clearing the way for federal activation of Camp Shelby. And uh, the uh, little uh, newspaper blurb there that uh, concerning the, the allocation of a rather sizable sum of money for the build, uh, for building up Camp Shelby is from the Clarion Ledger, uh, September 14, 1940. And it was announcing basically the opening of Camp Shelby as a national training center. The United States War Department very soon after authorized the activation of Camp Shelby as a two-division uh, training facility. And on September 6, 1940, Mississippi Governor Paul B. Johnson uh, signed the lease transferring Camp Shelby to the federal government. On September 12th, 1940, the U.S. Army awarded a multi-million dollar contract uh, to uh, two construction firms to build the facilities they needed at Camp Shelby. Uh, two days later, an ad was published in the Hattiesburg American calling for 5,000 construction workers to help build the base. Now this is a you know a United States that's still feeling the effects of the Great Depression, and when this this job offer for five thousand jobs went out, uh, the response was incredible. Thousands of Depression era Mississippians needing jobs flocked to Hattiesburg, and for uh, two days after the ad appeared, the region was swamped by an estimated ten thousand applicants. Uh, and there's a newspaper article was quoted as saying they arrived by cars, trucks, bicycles, and anything else that would roll. Uh, one applicant from Prentice, Mississippi walked 30 miles to uh, apply for a job with rags wrapped around his bare feet because he didn't have any shoes. This is just how desperate you know some uh, some Mississippians were for jobs. And uh, this photo uh, is of two construction workers. Uh, who were uh, came to Camp Shelby looking for a job. One was from Memphis, Tennessee, uh, and had formerly worked on a construction of a DuPont plant uh, in Tennessee. The other was from Decatur, Mississippi, and had previously, previously worked on another government job. And uh, they were able to get jobs at Camp Shelby, and one of them was later quoted as saying, uh, we live like kings out here. I never did carpenter work uh, before I heard you could get paid so much for it. Then it didn't take me long to be one. So it was just uh, uh, for uh, lots of uh, impoverished Mississippians, these federal jobs were just a godsend. And so that the, the, it was like a beacon call and, and people answered the call. The first troops to arrive at Camp Shelby were members of the 37th Infantry Division. And uh, shown here in the, in the bottom corner, that's the, the patch of the, the 37th Infantry Division. They were Ohio National Guard, and they arrived on October 22, 1940, and began training two days later. Uh, the camp was still under construction at that time, and the workforce by then had grown to 12,623 men, and the payroll for them was over a million dollars. By November 1940, uh, the camp was 90% complete, and the Army announced that there would be additional construction at Shelby to turn the installation into a permanent mobilization base. By mid-January 1941, there were over 50,000 soldiers stationed at Camp Shelby, and uh, the War Department had to increase the size of the camp by purchasing an additional 8,853 acres of private land. And uh, uh, shown in the, uh, the big picture here is an aerial view of the camp of the 145th Infantry Regiment, which was one of the uh, units making up the 37th Infantry Division at Camp Shelby. This is just a small portion of Camp Shelby, just to give you an idea for the massive size of the, of the, uh, of the, the camp. And this is, again, another aerial view, just giving you an idea of just how large Camp Shelby was during World War II. Uh, by late February 1941, uh, most of the major construction at Camp Shelby was complete uh, at a cost of, of about $22 million. Uh, there was still some minor construction going on, but the majority of the workforce was let go. 
By 1943, Camp Shelby consisted of 11,096 buildings, 180 miles of roads, 581,000 square feet of warehouse space, a water and sewage treatment system that could support a population of 100,000. Uh, the building area covered 12,000 acres, and it was surrounded by 300,000 acres of firing ranges and maneuver areas. Uh, the size of the, of the military population at Camp Shelby at, at any one time can only be estimated, uh, but it, probably at its greatest extent, it was somewhere around 75,000 soldiers in September 1943, making it one of the largest training centers for soldiers in the world at the time. Uh, civilian uh, employment at the camp probably also peaked in 1943 at about 3,700 uh, with, with civil service uh, uh, jobs and another thousand civilians employed on the post. Uh, during the six years that the camp was open as a federal training center, the average strength at Camp Shelby was probably about 50,000 soldiers, uh, making it the second largest city in the state while it was open. Now there were a number of units that trained at Camp Shelby during World War II. Uh, among them were the following divisions, uh, the 31st, the 37th, the 38th, uh, the 43rd, the 65th, the 69th, and the 95th. Uh, one of the more interesting units to train at Camp Shelby was the 442nd Regimental Combat Team made up of Japanese Americans. Uh, after completing their training, uh, this unit was sent to Europe and then it proceeded to compile one of the most uh, distinguished service records of any uh, Army unit during World War II. Uh, they were one of the most highly decorated units uh, in the European theater during, during the war. Among those uh, men who trained uh, with the 442nd at Camp Shelby was Daniel K. Uh, Inouye, uh, shown here in the picture on the right, uh, who was awarded the Medal of Honor and, and who later became a United States Senator from the state of Hawaii. And then shown on the left are other members of the 442nd uh, combat team uh, during their training at uh, Camp Shelby. Uh, the uh, uh, song uh, music up at the top there is uh, the cover of a song dedicated to the 442nd using their motto, uh, Go For Broke. And in addition to serving as a training base, Camp Shelby was also uh, home to a German prisoner of war camp. At peak strength, the camp housed about 5,300 German prisoners. Uh, shown at the left is just a formation of prisoners at Camp Shelby. Uh, on the right, uh, uh, the German prisoners are holding a funeral for, a, uh, for one of the POWs that died. And then uh, at the bottom here are some of the uh, coupons the prisoners could use at the camp canteen for buying things, uh, food and drink and uh, extra comforts uh, for, their, uh, for their living facilities. The last major unit to train at Camp Shelby uh, during World War II was the 95th Infantry Division. Uh, and after they, uh, after, uh, they finished training uh, in the fall of 1945, major training operations ceased. On December 29, 1945, uh, the camp newspaper published its final edition. And uh, one year later, the government began to sell off uh, the property from the camp. Uh, the camp officially closed as a federal installation on, in January 1947, and the post commander reported with pride that over 750,000 soldiers had trained for World War II service at Camp Shelby. And uh, shown up in the corner here is the notice of the sale of government buildings at Camp Shelby. Uh, this is from the Clarion Ledger, uh, Feb February 23, 1947. Now, Camp, Camp Shelby was not going to stay closed for long. It was going to reopen during the Korean War, and it's been in constant use ever since. Uh, and today, it is the largest state-owned military training site in the United States. Now, another very important uh, training facility uh, was located at Biloxi uh, during World War II. Uh, during the Great Depression, the city of Biloxi uh, uh, had, was in a very poor economic condition and city officials were really looking for anything that might bring much needed dollars into the community. Uh, one of their first projects they came up with involved the construction of a city airport using Works Progress Administration funds. 
In the late 1930s, Congress began spending more on national defense uh, with the threat of war looming, and one large recipient of funds such as these were, was the Army Air Corps. Now, Biloxi officials knew that the Army Air Corps needed new flight schools uh, to handle the influx of students that were going to come uh, as, as it began to ramp up operations, and they were determined to convince the federal government to build one of these schools at Biloxi. With the aid of Senator Pat Harrison and Congressman William M. Calmer, Biloxi officials began to lobby Congress to build an Army Air Corps training facility in Biloxi. And uh, shown here are some of the uh, pictures of the uh, Biloxi Municipal Airport from 1939. And then on the left is a drawing from the Clarion Ledger, uh, October 5, 1940, uh, showing the proposed additions to the airport that would uh, allow it to be a viable Air Army Air Corps base. Now, Biloxi was initially rebuffed by the Army, but uh, the city officials just refused to take no for an answer, and they decided to make the, uh, the government an offer it could not refuse. On November 4, 1940, uh, Biloxi Chamber of Commerce Secretary Anthony B. Ragusen, who is shown here in the center of this picture holding the flag, uh, sent Army Air Corps Brigadier General Rush B. Lincoln a package offer. Biloxi would give the government its modern airfield, including rail connections, paved roads uh, running from the airport to the state highway, plus a large amount of land for school facilities. And uh, this picture is uh, uh, of uh, Anthony B. Ragusen, who was uh, uh, leading up this, this effort to uh, win over the government. Uh, he's holding the flag of the light cruiser uh, USS Biloxi. Uh, Ragusen had gone on active duty with the Army Air Corps in 1941, and he served on the staff of the Commander-in-Chief of the Pacific Ocean Areas. And this picture is from the Clarion Ledger, uh, August 24, 1945. Now, Biloxi's very generous offer uh, really impressed General Lincoln, who's shown in this picture here. And he sent a recommendation to Washington that Biloxi should be chosen as a site for an airplane mechanics school. Uh, federal uh, approval was delayed, however, when the, the War Department decided to expand the size of the proposed Biloxi school from a 5,200-man facility to a 24,000-man facility. Uh, this forced uh, Biloxi officials to acquire more land, uh, with the, and with the additional property, uh, the proposed base took in land that had contained an 18-hole golf course, two more nine-hole golf courses, plus a clubhouse, a naval reserve park, a Boy Scout camp, a baseball field, and a number of privately owned homes. So uh, Biloxi, I mean, pulled out all of the stops. They wanted this base, and they wanted it bad, and they were willing to give up, give just about anything to get it. On March 6, 1941, uh, the War Department officially notified the mayor of Biloxi that the city had been selected for an Army Air Corps tr Technical Training School. The, Air Force, the airfield will be built on 832 acres of land, and on June 12, 1941, the War Department activated Air Corps Station No. 8 Aviation Mechanics School, Biloxi, Mississippi. Two days later, the government signed a contract for $10 million to build the training school. The initial design called for 661 buildings, including a 376 two-story barracks, 10 mess halls, 28 uh, administrative buildings, a 1,200-bed hospital, and in addition, uh, airplane and engine mechanic school would have five double hangars, six academic buildings, a headquarters, an engine test block, and an aircraft trainer building. The base would also have a petroleum storage area, two motor repair shops, two utility shops, 14 warehouses, a sewage disposal plant, an incinerator system, a railroad spur, a service club, two theaters, seven post exchange facilities, four firehouses, a post office, and last but not least, four chapels. Uh, it's just, it was a massive uh, building construction. It was beyond the wildest dreams of what Biloxi officials had hoped to get. And in late June 1941, the War Department officially named uh, the Biloxi facility the Keesler Army Airfield in honor of 2nd Lieutenant Samuel R. Keesler, shown here, 
uh, Jr. of Greenwood, a Mississippi Aerial Observer who was killed in action during World War I and had been awarded the Distinguished Service Cross. Now, when the War Department activated Keesler Airfield, uh, shown here in this picture, the local community uh, thought it was just getting a technical training school that might have a student population as high as maybe even 20,000. The government, however, uh, had other ideas and they decided to add on to this mission by making the airfield a basic training center for new recruits as well, which meant that Keesler's population was going to be much higher than anyone originally estimated. The first troops arrived for basic training at Keesler Airfield on August 21st, 1941. Uh, basic training for these soldiers would last four weeks, and then the new soldiers were sent on to specialist schools for advanced training. The airplane and mechanic schools opened on September 29th, 1941, and in May 1942, the Army Air Forces also directed Keesler to specialize in training mechanics to work on the B-24 heavy bomber. In 1944, the Army Air Force also moved its Air Sea Rescue Training School to Keesler, and the graduates of this school were mostly sent to the Pacific Theater of Operations, where they helped to save over 5,500 lives during the course of the war. And then uh, shown at the left here is a 1943 yearbook from Keesler Airfield, and uh, on the right are, is a picture postcard showing some mechanics working on a plane uh, at Keesler Field. Now, at its peak capacity uh, during World War II, Keesler had approximately 69,000 soldiers stationed at the facility, making it the largest air base in the world at the time. Uh, during and after World War II, approximately 141,000 men received specialized training as aircraft mechanics at Keesler. In addition, another 336,000 recruits received their basic training at the facility before the war ended. Uh, Keesler was kept in service uh, after the war ended and it is still an active air base uh, to this day. And then it, shown in this picture is the uh, 1946 graduating class uh, from uh, Keesler Air Force Base. Now another uh, prominent uh, facility in the state was Camp McCain, uh, which was located eight miles south of Grenada at Elliott, Mississippi. Uh, it was in Grenada County. It was opened by the United States Army as a training facility in 1942, and it consisted of about 42,000 acres. Uh, the camp was named in honor of Major General Henry P. McCain, shown here, a native Mississippian who served in World War I. Uh, General McCain was the great uncle of Senator John McCain of Arizona. Camp McCain had been designed as a division-sized training camp, and at its height, the base had approximately 40,000 soldiers training there, including some of the men shown in these pictures here. Uh, the 87th Infantry Division and the 94th Infantry Division uh, both trained at Camp McCain. Uh, both were later sent to Europe, where they uh, distinguished themselves in combat. Uh, McCain also had a POW camp where approximately 7,700 Germans were held. Uh, after the last troops left Camp McCain in, in 1944, uh, the War Department announced that the camp would be closed. Uh, the facility was officially deactivated on October 15, 1944, but in 1947, Camp McCain was reopened as a Mississippi National Guard training site, and it is still in use as a National Guard site to this day. And then. The next facility we're going to talk about uh, was in southwest Mississippi. And uh, in early 1941, uh, local officials in, in the southwestern part of the state organized the Southwest Mississippi Cantonment Association uh, to begin acquiring uh, leasing and purchasing rights to land in Wilkinson and Amit counties, because they were hoping to uh, encourage the War Department to build a military base in their region. Uh, the efforts of the local officials paid off, and on February 25, 1942, the government signed a contract uh, to begin construction of an Army training camp near Centerville on the Wilkinson Amit County line. Uh, the name of the facility was named for Confederate Major General Earl Van Dorn, a native of Port Gibson. And uh, shown on the left here is Colonel Robert E. Guthrie, the first post commander of Camp Van Dorn. 
And on the right is an article about the work of the, uh, the Southwest Mississippi Cantonment Association. Uh, these are both articles from the Macomb Enterprise Journal, January 16, 1942. At Camp Van Dorn, uh, roads, railroad spurs, and warehouses were built first. Uh, barracks and headquarters buildings were constructed a little bit later after the camp roads had been completed. The total size of the, the camp was about 41,844 acres. The first troops arrived for training in November 1942, and two of the main units to train at the camp were the 63rd Infantry Division and the 99th Infantry Division. Uh, camp Van Dorn was similar in size to Camp McCain, and a War Department report showed that by the end of 1945, the facility had barracks and buildings to house about 39,114 enlisted men, 2,173 officers, and it had a station hospital with a 750-bed capacity. And uh, shown on the left uh, is an article about the transfer of the 63rd Infantry Division to Camp Van Dorn. And on the right is an article about Dinah Shore uh, entertaining the troops at Camp Van Dorn. Now, Many of the northern soldiers who were sent to Camp Van Dorn were really in for a rude awakening as to uh, a life in rural Mississippi. They, one was quoted as saying, I thought it was the end of the world. Uh, this was Pennsylvanian Johnny Alt who trained at uh, Camp Van Dorn. Uh, Richard R. Rebert, who was historian of the 165th Engineer Combat Battalion, uh, described the initial reaction of some of the soldiers in his unit to Camp Van Dorn. And he said, located in swamp country, the semi-tropical vegetation and a complete set of insects, reptiles, and spiders in this camp of tar paper shacks presents a dreary a spectacle as a newly dug grave in a rain-sodden cemetery. <laughs> so a lot of the uh, northern troops that came to train at Camp Van Dorn uh, were not uh, uh, very happy to begin with and had some trouble uh, acclimatizing to, uh, to conditions in rural Mississippi. And in addition to uh, being a training camp, uh, Camp Van Dorn was also a German prisoner of war camp and uh, the camp was shut down when the war ended and then the, the facility was declared surplus by the government on October 1st, 1945. Now in addition to all of the training facilities in the state, there were also some very important uh, factories built in the state. Uh, Mississippi's first ammunition plant was built at Flora in Madison County at a cost of $15 million. Uh, the plant was completed in 1942 and was operated by the General Tire and Rubber Company of Akron, Ohio. Uh, the entire plant and support buildings covered 9,300 acres and that included 80 to 90 dirt covered bunkers for storing completed munitions. In addition, you also had ordnance units training at the plant. In fact, uh, this picture on the right shows uh, uh, a unit training at, uh, at, at uh, the ordnance plant, uh, uh, practicing setting off explosives. Uh, the flora plant was one of four identical plants that were built, and it, as it turned out, more efficient uh, production methods allowed one plant to do the work of four. And because of this, uh, the, the flora plant actually didn't open until May 10, 1945. Uh, and it made smokeless powder bags for 105 millimeter howitzers. Uh, and operation ceased uh, just a matter of months later on August 15, 1945, just you know, three months after work had started, uh, with uh, about 959,000 uh, howitzer bags completed. Now there was one other uh, ordnance plant in the state, uh, and, and it was even larger. It was at Prairie, Mississippi, near West Point in Monroe County. Uh, it was run by Procter & Gamble Defense Corporation, and the facility was known as the Gulf Ordnance Plant. Now, this was a $25 million project, and it employed over 7,000 construction workers who erected more than 300 buildings on the site. Uh, at the plant, many of the workers were women, and they were especially sought uh, to handle the delicate materials because they were thought to do a, a, a very, very competent job at, uh, at, uh, at that work. Uh, production at the plant ended in 1945, and uh, destruction of surplus war materials uh, continued at the site until 1946. 
Uh, the 3,000 acre site had various uses after the war, including a uh, trade training school and overhauling vehicles uh, during the Korean War. Now, Mississippi was also home during World War II to one of the more uh, interesting uh, programs uh, that was conceived during the war. In fact, uh, one historian described it as one of the most bizarre programs in Army history. Uh, Swiss immigrant William A. Uh, Prestry uh, somehow convinced the Army that uh, dogs could be trained to attack Japanese soldiers based on their smell. And once trained, these dogs could be dropped on Japanese-held islands in the Pacific to, to go after the defenders. And so the Army uh, selected Cat Island off the Mississippi coast uh, for this top secret training facility. Uh, and this is a picture taken on Cat Island of some of the, the dog trainers. And uh, the, the whole program was based on the, the assumption that these dogs could be trained to uh, detect a, a distinct smell that Japanese soldiers had. And uh, to train the dogs, uh, they needed Japanese. So 25 members of the 100 uh, 100 Infantry Battalion, made up of Japanese American soldiers, were uh, volunteered for this program. And uh, I'm not sure they volunteered or they were voluntold, but uh, they, the men were flown to Mississippi under tight security, sent to Ship Island uh, where they would be based, and then they would be uh, they would be uh, boated over to Cat Island uh, for the training. Now. These Japanese American soldiers uh, were sent to Mississippi in November 1942, and uh, they would take a boat each day to Cat Island for training with the dogs. And these are some of the men that were actually in that dog training program. And uh, this training was a very slow and uh, brutal process. Uh, Cat Island was very swampy. It was very humid. Uh, the men had to hide in unpleasant conditions while the dogs practiced tracking them down. And to instill an aggressive spirit in the dogs, uh, the soldiers were required to whip and shock them. Uh, the men wore padded gear to protect them from bites, but even so, uh, they ended up with all kinds of scars from the training. And uh, shown at the right uh, is Ray Nosaka, one of the Japanese American soldiers. Uh, he, there, he's on, in a fellow soldier on the boat uh, from Ship Island to Cat Island. Uh, by January of 1943, it was very apparent to all involved that the program was a total failure as the dogs uh, could not consistently uh, find and attack just the Japanese soldiers. So the plan was scrapped and a more conventional training plan was adopted. Uh, eventually, uh, military trainers uh, produced 400 dogs at the Cat Island facility to serve as scout and sentry dogs for which they were well uh, suited. And uh, even this activity ended in July uh, of 1944 when the, the Cat Island facility was closed and the remaining dogs and trainers were sent to other sites. Now, as I mentioned before, there were a number of POW camps in Mississippi during the war. And uh, Mississippi was the involuntary home to thousands of Axis soldiers during World War II. Uh, beginning with the surrender of Axis forces in Africa in 1942, Thousands of German and Italian soldiers fell into uh, Allied hands, and eventually over 400,000 were sent to the United States for confinement. Uh, of that number, about 20,000 were sent uh, to prisoner of war camps throughout Mississippi. And because of the security considerations, uh, most of the prisoner of war camps in the United States were placed in rural and uh, lightly populated states of the South and the Southwest. Uh, there were four main uh, prisoner of war camps in Mississippi. Uh, Camp McCain near Grenada uh, held about 7,700. Camp Clinton in Hines County held about 3,400. Uh, Camp Shelby at Hattiesburg uh, held about 5,300. And Camp Como in Panola County originally held about 3,800 Italian soldiers, but they were soon moved out of state and they were replaced by a smaller number of German prisoners. And uh, shown in the upper left here is the entrance to Camp Clinton prisoner of war camp. Uh, and lower right, these are some of the prisoner barracks at Camp Shelby. And then shown in the upper right is uh, Brigadier General Stolberg, uh, who was a prisoner at uh, Camp Clinton. And in fact, uh, the Camp Clinton facility was the place where most of the German generals and also one German admiral 
that the United States captured during the war were held. So in addition to having just regular enlisted prisoners, the, the Clint facility also held some of the, the most high profile prisoners that the United States had in its custody. And uh, this ends my little presentation on military installations in Mississippi. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. If you have any questions, please post the comments below. If you, uh, if you enjoyed this, this presentation, please give it a like and, uh, and subscribe to my channel if you haven't done so already. Uh, I plan to do one more uh, video uh, related to Mississippi and the World, uh, World War II, related more to uh, uh, how uh, women and other, uh, uh, and other civilians uh, in Mississippi uh, made out during World War II, and that will be coming shortly. But uh, I hope you enjoyed this, uh, this presentation, and uh, I hope to see you again soon.